Good morning, church. I want to welcome you to our online service. Thanks for joining us again this Sunday. Today is a very special day, as many of you already know. It's Mother's Day today. We're celebrating mothers today. All around the world, we're celebrating our mothers because they're so incredible. And we're going to do that in just a moment. We have something to share uh, for our mothers. But before we do that, I just have a couple announcements that I'm going to make. Uh, and the first is to make sure that you're aware that our church picnics that we're going to start on May the 16th, which was next Sunday, we were going to start having church picnics. Uh, we are going to put that on pause. As you know, we have these new restrictions. They've restricted it to five people outside now. So we're going to put those on pause. But rather than just not doing anything, I want to encourage all of you to go to our church website. I'm going to put the actual link here on the screen. Go to our online church directory. If you're a member of Northern Hills Church, you should have a password. If you don't, just email the church and I'll give you that password so you can access our church directory. But I encourage you to get in touch with someone in our church for next Sunday morning and have lunch with them. Meet them somewhere outside. Uh, obviously, it needs to just be five people. But we really want to encourage you for next Sunday morning to just think of somebody this, this coming week. Get in touch with them. Maybe do it right after service is over. Get in touch with somebody. Plan a lunch. Get together with somebody. Even though we have these restrictions, it doesn't mean we're not allowed to see anybody. So I really encourage you to try that. And then the last thing is about our next in-person service, which is scheduled right now for May 30th. Our plan is to go ahead and have that service as long as uh, they release that restriction of 15 people. And so we're going to go ahead and just continue to plan on that. Obviously, if things change after this three-week period and they keep it at 15 people, then we may uh, change those plans. But for now, you can go ahead and you can pre-register. If you didn't attend our last one, which was uh, last Sunday, May the 2nd, if you weren't there at that service, then you can pre-register until, I think, till next week, until the 16th, which is when full registration starts for May the 30th service. And so if you weren't there last time, go ahead and sign up. You get a head start to sign up. Uh, if you were there last time, we want you there as well. We want to fill all of our spots. Hopefully we're allowed to have 31 people again. And so after May the 16th, you'll be able to register. Uh, as I said, it's Mother's Day. We want to honor our mothers. And in order to do that, I have a video that I'm going to share with you today. The first little bit of this video is actually just some clips from online. I thought it would be a good idea on Mother's Day to put a smile on all our mothers' faces and all, on all of our faces. Um, and so I'm going to show you a video of some pranks that mothers did on their kids. So these are some videos of moms just goofing around with their kids. Hopefully it puts a smile on your face. And then we'll have a little clip to honor you, our moms. Come on, Parker, come here. You gotta see this quick. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Knock, knock. Who's it? Interrupting cow. says lightly salted and dry roasted. Open it. You want me to open it? All right, let's see what's inside of here. <laughs> it's like some yummy peanuts. <laughs> <laughs> 
Mom, guys. One more time. All right, let's see. All right, well, I am super hungry, and I think peanuts will be just the right thing to eat. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. We love you. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. We love you. We love you, Mommy. Thank you for all that you do. We love you, Mommy. Happy Mother's Day. We love you, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. We love, love you. Love you. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. We love you, Mom, so much. Love you, Mom. Love you, Mom. I'm going to invite you into a time of worship in just a few moments. I have a few songs I'll lead, and I invite you to sing along with me. In your homes. But before we move into that portion of the service and away from this portion where we're honoring our moms, I want to ask that you join me in praying for our moms. Let's, let's pray together over our moms. And so if you have your mom there with you in the, wherever you're watching, I want to ask that you go and you sit next to her. So this includes you kids. I'm going to give you a couple minutes to go and sit next to your mom. Put your arm around your mom. Hold your mom's hand. Let's lay hands on our moms. Let's pray over them. And so again, I ask that you join me in this prayer. And if you don't have your mom, I know many of us aren't watching right now with our mom, but I want to encourage you to just hold out your hands and to join me in, in this prayer over them. Let's go ahead. Let's pray for them. Let's pray over them. And then let's praise God together. God, we are so grateful this morning as we reflect upon the incredible nature of, of what you provided in this world through our moms. God, they are a great gift to so many of us. They pro provide us with so much love, so much support, so much encouragement. So God, we look to you this morning in praise for that. We see you through our moms, through the love that they pour out for us. We see you and we give you glory for that. And right now, Lord, we pray over our moms this weight, this responsibility that they carry to love their children, to provide for their children, to be strength for their children. God, we ask your Holy Spirit to be their provider, their strength. Give them the energy that they need, Lord. Give them the faith that they need. Again, God, we praise you and we thank you for our incredible moms, and it's through Jesus that we pray and we now praise. Amen. Water you turned into wine, open the eyes of the blind, there's no one like you. Like you, 
into the darkness you shine out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you none like you stand against and if our God is for us then who could ever stop us and if our God is with us then what could stand against what could stand God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, he's awesome in power, our God, our God, stick her out one more time together, our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, He's awesome in power, our God, our God. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He 
your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. We're going to go ahead and dismiss our kids now so they can watch their video lesson for the day. And as they do that, again, as we do each week, we're going to leave you a few minutes here to read through the scripture that Jamie's about to preach from. And so go ahead and find your Bible, open up your Bible app if you have that with you. Let's spend a couple minutes reading through scripture, reflecting on it, and then we'll hear from Jamie. Good morning, friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Do you remember those pre-pandemic days when families would actually go grocery shopping together? It was before those signs on every door saying, one person per household, please. When was the last time you saw a child throw a tantrum because mom put the cookies back on the shelf? Or because dad wouldn't give in to the impulse chocolate buy? Or better yet, when was the last time you heard that polite yet kind of shaming announcement over the PA system crackle saying, would the parents missing their child please come get them from customer service? I have many siblings, which means my mother, saint of a woman that she is, on top of making sure she didn't forget the milk or the carrots, or making sure she didn't run over someone else's kids, had to constantly be counting one, two, three, four. Okay, let's get out the door. Now, luckily, the co-op near our house had a room that was set aside for childcare while you shopped, and that was to deal with this very nuisance. But at such a young age, I had a very good understanding of how dangerous strangers could be. And over my dead body would I be dropped off with them. So while many other parents had the luxury of dropping their kids off and going to shop kid-free, my mom was stuck with me. 
Now, I've since learned that the way product is laid out on the shelf is very intentional. It's designed to catch your eye, especially the eye of a child. And as we walked past one of these kid traps, I can't remember exactly if it was the Fruit Loops or the Chips Ahoy cookies, I stopped because I was mesmerized by this wall of treats. But when the spell wore off, I looked left, I looked right, and I was all alone in the aisle. And so I did what any child aspiring to be a responsible, independent adult would do. I sat down and cried. Can you blame me? I was lost. You know, lost is a word that so accurately describes the past year. We've lost loved ones who died this year, and we were not able to grieve them at their funeral. We've lost time with our family and friends, time that we can never get back. We've lost opportunities in our jobs. We've lost chances at ministry. We've lost out in our relationships. We've lost faith in the experts. We've lost faith in the government. We've lost vision for what our lives can be as we wait and wait and wait for the end that they say is just around the corner. We are lost. Jesus taught about being lost, though it was a different sort of lostness with much more destructive consequences than a ballooning deficit. He taught about being lost on a path absent of God. He spoke of eyes that had lost God's vision and hearts that had lost his compassion. And he wasn't talking about them, those sinners over there, those ones that we're so quick to judge. He was talking about me. He was talking about you. He was talking about anyone with ears to hear. We are lost. And the parable we're going to read today sounds like a them parable. It sounds like a parable about those people who are lost. Those people with lifestyles that we disagree with. Or with political and social values that are different from our own. But this isn't a parable for them. Whoever they are. It's a parable for us. Let them who have ears hear. And let them who have eyes hear. Read Luke 15, verse 1 to 7. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulder and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. I told you last week that parables are not proverbs. Proverbs are a saying that have a broad, though not universal, application. The early bird gets the worm is an example of a modern-day proverb. And many of you experienced that as you tried to book campsites or vaccination appointments over the last few days. Parables are different. They're told in a specific setting, possibly more than once, but they always have a context. And this parable was told to a group of God-fearing people who thought they were following God the best way they knew how. Does that sound familiar? We often label the Pharisees as the antagonists in Jesus' story. Now, they do oppose him at every turn, but there are both historical and literary reasons for that. Now, this might surprise you, but historically, Jesus was more like the Pharisees than any other Jewish group. He was most like them in theology, 
in how they viewed the scriptures, and in how they practiced their faith. So their disagreements, which we see a lot of, are more like squabbles between siblings that focus on the 3% difference instead of the 97% similarity. Now, it doesn't mean that these differences aren't significant. You know, you may have heard that human DNA is, on average, only 3% different than ape DNA. And yet, we are very different creatures. But this closeness between Jesus and the Pharisees is why they show up so much in the Gospels. Now, the second reason, the literary reason, is because the Pharisees offer us an implicit warning. It's easy for those of us who have been Christians for a while to revert to Pharisaic ways of thinking. It's easy to say, those people are lost, but I am not. It's easy to create distinctions and to say that Jesus' teaching was for them, but I'm beyond that now. It's easy to point out the speck in your friend's eye when you have a plank in your own. But that's what we do when we say those sinners instead of us sinners. It's a 3% difference, but it creates a whole other creature. Now, does that mean there's no room for conviction amongst Christians? Well, of course there still is. But it comes out of our identity as a fellow sinner, not our identity as a righteous saint. Because the gift of God is that we are simultaneously one and the other. And it doesn't come from a place of condemnation. But as we'll see, it comes out of celebration. And to get this point across to the Pharisees, Jesus put them in the shoes of the shepherd. Today, we attach a lot of spiritual significance to the role of a shepherd. But they did not. The shepherds were pretty low on the social ladder. Some people even considered them on par with tax collectors. And their word was not to be trusted in the courts. Now, that wasn't a biblical law, but it was one that had developed over time. But Jesus tells this parable through the eyes of a shepherd to confront their prejudice against those sinners. And perhaps it would be similar to me saying to you, suppose you owned a brothel and one of your workers went missing. You know, it's not my intent to make a moral comparison between these occupations, but I want you to see the force that this parable would have had on his original listeners. Now, the image of a shepherd isn't always negative. When the image is applied to God, it's quite different. And if you want some extracurricular reading for your Sunday afternoon, go to Exodus 34, the whole chapter. Read Exodus 34. It's a very positive account of how God is a shepherd. And it will help you to understand the significance of the Old Testament allusions in this parable, and also when Jesus talks about shepherds in other parables. But for now, suppose one of you is a dirty, cheating, thieving shepherd, and one of your sheep go missing. Won't you leave the 99 and go look for the one? I don't want you to get hung up on leaving the 99. The parable isn't saying that this one super sheep was more important or valuable than the other 99. Parables are short and brief, and they're usually to the point. That means that they have gaps. One of those gaps would be saying that there were probably other shepherds in this flock, or that he had bought a hired hand for the day. But that's beside the point of the parable. The point is that the shepherd values this one sheep, so he goes to look for it. And do you know what sheep do when they're lost? They're a lot like little Jamie, lost in a grocery store. They sit down and cry. Okay, maybe they don't cry, but they do lay down and wait and hope the shepherd will get to them before the wild animals do. And so when the shepherd finds this lost sheep, he's overjoyed. Overjoyed because he got there first. And he carries that creature home. There, he throws a party to celebrate his good fortune, saying, Rejoice with me, 
I have found my lost sheep. And that's where the parable ends, with this celebration of finding what was lost. Remember, parables are always answering a question, whether it's explicit or implied. And the question that starts this parable is, why does Jesus eat with sinners? And his explanation of the parable in verse 7 makes this clear. He says, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. And it doesn't matter if this is the first time you repent, the seventh time you repent, or the 70 times seventh time you repent. God's response is always celebration. That should change the way that we see repentance. And this is a far cry from the conviction we are used, we're used to in our cancel culture today. Keep in mind, cancel culture isn't a new thing. It's been around as long as culture has. It's called shame. Shame-based conviction uses fear to force people to change their ways or to retract the things that they've said. Shame-based conviction creates an in-group and an out-group. And it was the Pharisees' go-to weapon. And it's still a weapon today. Shame-based conviction is used to attack others, not to build them up. It's used to create distance, not to welcome others at home. It comes from cold, dispassionate, impersonal rules instead of a relationship that's built on mutual trust. And it's not the Jesus way. Can you imagine how different this parable would read if when the shepherd found the sheep, he scolded it, dragged it home, and ignored it until it learned not to get lost? We can't even imagine that coming from the lips of Jesus. And yet, we'll do that in his name? No, Jesus shows us a better way. His way is a celebration of repentance, our repentance, because we are no better than someone who has yet to repent. We have no right to talk down to them, to throw Bible verses at them, or to cloak our own hate in the words of Jesus. Rather, Jesus' way maintains the distinction between guilt and shame. Guilt is action-based. And God declares us guilty when we sin. There's no avoiding that. I'm guilty. You're guilty. Everyone is guilty. That's why we need to repent. That's why we need the cross. But shame, shame is identity-based, meaning it's a statement about, it's not a statement about what we did, but about who we are. And it's a punishment that's administered by our peers. But judgment and punishment are not for us to hand out. Instead, Jesus taught us to celebrate every act of repentance. Because one repentant sinner brings God more joy than 99 who don't have to. Does that mean he doesn't love the 99 as much? No. It means that what was lost is now found. So let's celebrate. As I sat on that tiled floor in co-op, it's not an exaggeration to say that I felt like my world was ending. It was hopelessly lost. But my mother was not content to leave me there. And when she turned the corner and saw me sitting in my despair, what do you think her response was? To chastise me for getting lost? Or to carry me back to my flock of siblings? You also have a father who was not content to leave you lost. He gave up what it meant to be God and became a human, lived a sinless life, and died an undeserved death to take our shame and guilt from us. And we remind each other of this every time we gather, whether in person or remote. So I ask you, if Jesus takes away our shame and guilt, how can we then turn and heap the same on others? So I want you to take 
the bread and the cup. And I want you to remember the words of Psalm 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgression from us. And now ask yourself, just how far is the east from the west? I'm going to pray and then partake of the elements during this next song. And remember, Jesus' body was broken for you and his blood shed for you. Lord God, I ask that you would make the truth of your gospel so clear to us. Remind us that we are sinners saved by grace and allow us to extend mercy grace, understanding, and empathy to those who are caught in sin. Holy Spirit, help us to be your representative to lead people out, but not to shame, not to talk down. Give us wisdom to walk the line between love and conviction, between mercy and not tolerating sin. Speak to us this week. Thank you, Holy One. Amen. Partake. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. Overwhelming, never failing, endless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. And I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Overwhelming, never failing, endless love of God. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. When I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. love of God oh it chases me down fights till I'm found leaves the 99 and I couldn't earn it I don't deserve it till you give yourself away oh the overwhelming never failing endless love shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me 
no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me, it's true for me and you. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. One more time, sing like we mean it. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Oh, the overwhelming, never failing, endless love of God. Oh, it chases me down. Fights till I'm found, leaves the 99, and I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away, oh the overwhelming, never failing, endless love of God, yeah. I'm going to close our service with a benediction from the book of Hebrews. And please take some time to pray in your homes after the service concludes. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Have a great week.